Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 256, featuring the third installment of my interview with Mr. Fergus Urquhart of Obsidian. In this part of the interview, we talk about the demise of Interplay and all of the unfortunate events that led up to the closure of Black Isle Studios, probably the world's greatest uh, role-playing game studio of all time. I will be looking at the role that Interplay, Interplay Sports had on that, as well as a service called Engage, and a little bit about these projects that sadly uh, were canceled. We're going to start off, though, talking about Planescape Torment. Anyway, we've got a lot of great stuff to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Fergus Urquhart. All right, so let's move on to Planescape Torment. Mm -hmm. You know, definitely one of my one of my favorites. I wonder how much you know involvement you had with that. You know, what kind of influence mm -hmm. you had over the, the the game design. I'm also curious about this dynamic with uh, Guido, Hinkle, and, and uh, yeah, Guido, yeah. Hinkle, right, and mm -hmm. uh, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so my involvement. Um, so I was running the division. Uh, you know, early on, really my big involvement, and this would have been in 1996, um, is that you know we had, when I took over Black the comp, you know RPG division, it just there's all these projects. There was like there was there was like ten there was like three Planescape projects, you know, and and there was like three other D and D. There was there was like ten projects, and there was fifty people in the division. So like you can do the math. There's not many people working on it. I mean, there was a plane. There was one Planescape game that had like had one person working on it, you know, it's like, well, how is this all going to get done? You know? And so we kind of like canceled some projects and collapsed things and pushed things together. And so one of the things was, well, what are we going to do with Planescape? And, and, um, and I was talking to Chris Avalon and, you know, it's really what he wanted to work on. And, and a lot of it is we just talked about like the, the box. We, so, and I, and I said, well, let's, I don't want to go make more technology. So let's, we can use the Baldur's Gate engine. And so let's use the Baldur's Gate engine. It's planes scape. So we should go to multiple planes. Like let's say three sigil is, you know, is huge as, as a, I mean, it's just, it's cool to have this huge fantasy city that is, you know, the city of doors that you can go all these different places. So let's have that mostly based in that. And you go to all these different planes um, and let's make that the box. You know, and, you, and and no, you don't need to make it multiplayer and, and all this kind of stuff. And and that's really what Chris ran with. And, you know, and I, I read design documents and I made, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I just read design documents, made comments on that, helped make sure that the team got staffed and staffed with good people. Um, but my involvement at that point was not huge um, for a while um, because, uh, well, Fallout was going on and then Fallout 2 and Baldur's Gate and all this other kind of stuff. Um, kind of the last, I would say the last six months, four or five, six months, I came, I was able to kind of start spending some more time on it again. Um, and it's one of the, it's actually interesting. Torment's one of the games, sometimes it's very hard to finish your own games before they come out, just particularly my game or the games I work on because they're huge. And so Torment was, I actually finished Torment, I think three times before it came out. And, and the, the, what I worked on, my part in it at the end, was combat, you know, combat, every, you know, people say, RP, you know, Torment, awesome RGB, RPG, comment is okay. Like, it's not horrible, but it's certainly not great. And, and so my thing was, it was, it was really not good when I, for, when I came out of the project. And so I kind of helped and just focused on that. Um, and the other thing I did was just, uh, was sort of helped out on the kind of the character leveling. Um, there wasn't uh, not a lot of time, it's just like there wasn't a lot of time spent in combat, sort of like leveling is very attached to your abilities in combat. And so those hadn't been worked on a lot. Like Chris had done all this amazing stuff with like putting the tattoos on and changing classes and all this other kind of cool thing. Um, but then how did that roll into actually the combat game system and, and with leveling up and all the XP and stuff like that? Um, so I just kind of worked on that with the designers and, and, and helped get a system in place where we could easily balance the game across the whole thing. So. A lot of detail, but yeah, that was that was that was kind of my my part in in torment. All right, so in two thousand we get Icewind Dale, mm -hmm. and I remember I was really excited about this because one of the things I didn't like about Baldur's Gate, at least when I first heard about it, was I, I wanted to create my own party, right, and have like six people. Yeah, so uh, you know, what were your thoughts at the time? And I guess uh, I noticed later on I read an interview where you said it'd be an un unrealistic nowadays to have you know people have to create six whole characters before they. <laughs> 
before they play. But I mean, what was it? Tutorial at all. Yeah, how to, <laughs> I guess that just wasn't even an issue back then. You're like, okay, yeah. let's do this. Got it. Yeah, no, I think with Isendale, it, it really was this, I, you know, I was trying to, like, um, weirdly enough, what was going on was we were working on, we were working on Fallout 3. And, and but we, we wanted to make it 3D because, you know, it was starting as, as a big thing. And it was only going okay. Like, we were just, we were, we didn't really have the technology programmers and this is where the divisionalization at interplay didn't work well because we were all our little pods and then if there was something that one pod needed to do that really required a larger amount of resources um like something like make a 3d engine um like we just couldn't work together to like say well then let's kind of create this other group of our employees for a period of time to to kind of start developing this 3d engine and so all of us were doing all of our own stuff. So it was fine when it came to like game assets and stuff like that, but not technology. So Fallout 3 was, was um, it just wasn't moving forward very quickly. The weirdest thing about working on Fallout 3 at, at Black Isle was that we were, the 3D technology we were using was this thing called, was, was an early 3D engine called NDL, um, which NDL was then bought or merged, whatever became Alienware. And Alienware is the engine that Bethesda uses um, for their stuff. So weirdly enough, we started developing Fallout 3 on the same technology that then Beth Bethesda would use to make Fallout 3 so many years later. But with, with Icewind, so it just wasn't going well, and Interplay was having a lot of financial problems, and I, I, needed, to, I needed to come up with something that was more of a sure thing, not, not a sure thing from a standpoint of like, it was just a phone it in project, but a, like the technology wasn't an issue. And so like, well, we, 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 we have the fallout engine, you know, but like, that's kind of reaching the end of its road. We, and then we, we obviously work with bio really well and we have that engine. So what could, how could we use that? And, and, and that's just where the idea, and this one I can say, I mean, I, I not, you know, very few of the great ideas that I'm associated or that I'm associated with in my career are mine. Um, but this one was really one that I said, let's do, um, let's, let's, let's do a dungeon crawler. You know, let's take the Baldur's Gate engine and let's do a dungeon crawler. Just focus on combat, you know, have levels go high, have you start with a six person party, you know, and just focus on that, focus on the strategic, like really kind of tactical combat that, you know, obviously still have a story and cool items and all that other kind of stuff, but really focus it as more of, more of a linearish dragon dungeon crawl. Cause it would feel then very different from Baldur's Gate, um, and that's really where it came from. And then I, I kind of came in the office that morning after thinking about it in the morning. And I got some guys said, let's do this. And someone came up with a story and sounded good. I went over, talked to Brian. I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to stop working on follow three. I'm going to do this. And this is why I said, go do it. And, you know, and that's, I, I can say, um, that's an amazing thing that Brian has is he trusts people and, and um, you have to prove things, but if you prove it, he, he, a lot of the great things, I mean, well, I don't all, I mean, almost, you can say probably almost all of the great things that happened in Interplay were because Brian, like, let them happen and didn't, like, didn't, it's so easy to say no. You know, that's the hardest thing about being a developer, working with publishers where there's so much political pressure to not fail, that it's so easy to say no. And, um, you know, there's some publishers I pitched really good projects to, you know, obviously different ones, probably 17 times. And it never gets past the first conversation, even though they're all super cool games. They even admit they're cool, but they just can't get to move forward. Um, so that, I, I would say that's a great thing about Brian is he, he, he really was good about trusting and not saying no. So, but anyway, so that was, yeah, that's pretty much how the Icewind Dale thing got all off the ground. What happened with Stone Keep 2? You know, I, I had Peter Oliphant on. Okay. Yeah, and he was talking about how even with Stone Keep One, that you know they kept running this problem where that they were taking so long, I guess, with the development that the actual technology would <laughs> catch up to right. them and then pass it up, and suddenly it looked yep. obsolete. Is that yep. more or less what was going on with the, the second one? So the second one never even get off the ground. I don't. So no, no, there was people working on it for quite a while. Um, Brian, so Stone Keep Two was hard because it was sort of because it was an RPG. It became a part of, you know, my about became a part of Black Isle. Um, and I was, you know, I was kind of concerned about it from, from the get go, you know, but Brian really, Brian really felt strongly that we should try to do it. And so, okay, so well then, um, you know, then 
then yes, we're gonna we're gonna do it. So we you know we hired some very good people and 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 we tried to make an engine. That's really what it was. So this is this is the hard thing that was happening to a lot of people. I think in the late nineties, is that suddenly all of, all of us had to now develop three D engines, and so we were developing a three D engine for Stonekeep. And there's certainly like, it's interesting. I, if I could find some of the screenshots of some of the stuff from like nineteen ninety eight. 97, 90, not me, 97, 98, somewhere in the 98, maybe 99 era. If I could find those screenshots and show people today, they'd be like, holy crap. Like, like, yeah, that doesn't look like modern as in today, but like, I would assume that game was maybe made five years ago. So like, we're doing some pretty cool things. Um, the problem is, is just the game as a game never, it just kept on becoming something else, you know, and, and uh, Eric DeMilt, um, uh, who was working at Black Isle at the time, um, who's working actually here at Obsidian again. Uh, he was the producer on that. And that, yeah, I think we were just talking about Stonekeep 2 like a couple days ago and, and, and with a producer that we were trying to help understand <laughs> about being a good game producer. And, and that was one of the things he said is it was just like, it was his failing in that he just was, it was always, it was always a shiny object. Oh, we could do this, we could do that. Let's, let's go solve really hard problems because if we solve really hard problems, then we're going to make something amazing. And so I think Stonekeep really, it wasn't so much that the technology was like losing to other technology coming out. It was just sort of technology chasing its own tail in some way. And, uh, and so it just, we could just never get to a point where it was a game. All right, so a quick question about Icewind Dale 2. Mm -hmm. I was reading about the, apparently there were some challenges with uh, modifying the engine for the third edition rules. To a point... Um, all in all, all in all, it went fairly smoothly. I mean, it was, it was actually smooth. Yeah, I know. I felt it was it actually went pretty smooth. I mean, I, and I'll, can, I can, some of it, I have pretty direct understanding of. Um, it was funny because Josh, it was Josh came to me, Josh Sawyer came to me. It would, we were working on Icewind Dale 2 and it was still, um, second edition D and D. And he came, he says, and he, or he was talking to Darren, right? And then and that was it. And then Darren warned me that Josh was going to try to tell, convince me to make it third edition. I'm pretty sure that's how it went. And and I'm like, that's, and I was like, okay, I was saying, that was crazy. And so I, um, uh, so Josh came and talked to me and then, and then I kind of listened and I went over it. And the interesting thing about um, Infinity Engine is so much of it is run by data. You know, you can say, oh, every game is data. But like, you know, anybody that knows anything about Infinity, the Infinity Engine, just, I mean, there are folder, there's a folder that's 2DAs, two dimensional arrays. So they're just these, um, uh, it's like a spreadsheet. You know that has all this data in it, and it was amazing how much the how much of that game you can change the game rules you can change just by changing those text files. And Josh had been fiddling around with it, and he was able to get pretty far because a lot of the core mechanics of third edition versus second edition are not different. It's still rolling d twenty, you still have hit points, you still go levels at certain experience points. You know, the big problem was feats and and sort of the spell system and stuff like that. And, and ultimately, my job in that, which I thought was the worst part we were going to have, is trying to move the spell system over. And then, you know, and I was, I don't know, I, I don't even know how it got on my plate, but it got on my plate. And I just started, I opened up the, the spell editor, and I just started going through the spells. Open a spell. Okay, what's the, how does the third edition work? Oh, like this, this, this. And, and um, it was the pro it was, I'm pretty sure it was a programmer at Bioware. His name was Scott Grieg. I don't think he's there anymore. Um, and he he came up with the spell editor and he did it in such a way that it was very like, it almost didn't care that it was D and D like, it, you know, so much of the D and D rules you kind of put into the spell editor. And so for the 300 so spells, like I was able to transfer over, like, I don't know, 250, 260 of them just using the editor. And then the rest, you know, 20% or so had to actually use some programming. But so it ended up being a lot easier than, than we all thought. Or I thought. Josh thought it was going to be easy. I thought it was going to be easy. <laughs> what can you tell me about Baldur's Gate 3, the Black Hound? The Black Hound. Huh. Let's see. What can I tell? So uh, it seems every story where, of, of a project that doesn't move forward, I start with a conversation about us building our own engine. Um, so so we were building our own engine. <laughs> um, now, now, the interesting thing why I think the, this one was really outside influences that ended up making so the game couldn't happen. Um, but because what we really did with, with um, Baldur's Gate 3 uh, is that 
the engine we were building, uh, actually Chris Jones, who's one of my partners here at Obsidian, so he's one of the owners of Obsidian. So he had actually left uh, Black Isle and he went worked to Troika for a while and then he actually came back. And and Chris Jones was pretty much um, was pretty much like the main architect on the Fallen engine. And then he architected the Arcanum engine, and then he architected pretty much the Arcanum engine changing into the Temple of Elemental Evil engine. Um, and then he came over to work on and sort of architect Baldur's Gate 3. And so, and we had a lot of interesting ideas. Um, again, weirdly enough, you know, some of the renderings of, of that, I look, I have those, some of those I do have of that. I mean, don't look modern now, but knowing that they were from like, you know, 2001, you know, you'd be like, wow, that was 13 years ago. Um, so, um, uh, <laughs> he must've heard his name. It was Chris Jones at my door. Um, so anyway, so, uh, and so, so, you know, we were developing that and it was, you know, again, when you're doing an engine, it's, you're, you're going through a lot of like, you're trying to build a car while the engine is running, you know? And so, and so it's always hard. Like you kind of get the, the car moving forward and now you're, now you're, Oh, you know, God, we let's take the car. Well, can't stop the engine, you know? And so like, it's, 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 it's really hard. Um, but things were getting better and we we're doing a pretty good job. And then the unfortunate thing that happened was, is that Interplay lost the D and D license. <sighs> Now, so now we had an engine. That now must have we, been a real nightmare. Oh, it, was horrible. One. it was horrible. I mean, it was one of my main reasons for leaving. Because what I was were like, they thinking? Um, they were out of money. You know, uh, it, there's no there's no other way to explain it as they were out of money. You know, and um, they'd already gone through some negotiations with them. And I don't know. So it just, yeah, they were out of money. You know, and, and, um, uh, and so uh, I just... It was super depressing, you know, and that's really what spawned, that was one of the main things that spawned me leaving. Um, and then the team, after I left, the team, like, went on to use that engine to kind of prototype Fallout 3 again. That would be the second Fallout 3. Um, and uh, and then, unfortunately, Interplay didn't want to move forward with it because they were going to, you know, the way to survive was to get money from Bethesda um, for Fallout rather than trying to spend money to make another game. Why were they losing so? Why were they out of cash? Did they have a so they're out of too cash. many bombs, not enough hits. I mean, what was the? Uh, well, yeah, I think that's. I think I mean, inter, uh, so they made some bets, right? They made a couple bets. One of the bets was, of course, you know, looking hindsight, you'd look at it and go, "Well, that was stupid." Um, but very, you know, early on, I would say it was in the mid '90s. And Brian was saying, like, well, one of the things we don't do is sports games. And everyone, you know, now would say, why would you do sports games? I mean, Madden? Why go up against Madden? Well, Madden wasn't Madden in 95. You know, it was not the, the juggernaut that it would become, you know, five, six years later. And so, and so this idea is like, well, let's, the new consoles, like the PlayStation's coming out, the Saturn is coming out. Let's, like, let's, Brian even said, if we can be a strong number two in sports, like, we can do great you know and he had the numbers and had a whole thing unfortunately they just they barely i think they maybe shipped one they shipped one ps1 game late the saturn one got canceled because the saturn was dead by the time it was done um they didn't move on to the and anyway so but all this money was funneled into the license because sports licenses were not expensive they had the hockey license they had the nfl license so there's all this money and and i don't and it just unfortunately it just didn't come together the other thing that happened was is that Interplay invested in this um, internet gaming service called Engage, and again, it seemed to make sense. Gamers were starting to play online, and certain and like certain like online services were making a lot of money, um, and so this thing called Engage was created, um, and and a lot of infrastructure was invested in and stuff like that. Unfortunately, what happened is that was all going on, and before it was completely done, um, done, and therefore making money was because back then it was hard to play over the internet. You know, everything was IPX and it was local network. And then I forgot what it was called, not Karma. Car can't remember the thing, but some dude wrote something that let you play, I play IPX games across the internet, you know, with TCP IP. And so the whole need for these services that would let match make, match make care players to play these local LAN games over the network was no longer needed. And so... That again was unfortunately a lot of money, and then the, and then like I was saying, you know, the division the, in the case of Black Isle, the divisionalization worked great. In other in other divisions like sports, it didn't work as well. And so Interplay made a lot of money off of certain things, and unfortunately, not enough money off of a lot of other things. 
So I guess the moral of the story is stick with role playing games. <laughs> well, I, I thought, you know, and I, I even, I even at one point that was before I left. I mean, I put pitched this whole thing together, and I said, why don't you sell? Like, look, Watsy wants to make like Wizards of the Coast wants to make money. Why don't you find a publisher, sell Black Isle with the rights, you know, with the D and D rights, with Fallout, you know, and we have like I forgot what else we maybe had going on, and we so we had games in development. We could show things. We had Fallout. I go, just sell us. And I, I think I said, I, I don't know why you couldn't get, with all of those things, why you couldn't get 22, you know, $20 million. And the, it wasn't Brian, but it was the, the president of, of Interplay at the time. Just said, I don't think Black Owl's worth anything. And that was that, you know, and so. <laughs> That's, that is a sad tale. Of course, I mean, on a, on a positive note, though, you did form Obsidian. Yes. You know, so we got... Chris Avalon, Chris Jones, who apparently was just just in the room. Yes. <laughs> uh, Chris Parker, Don, uh, Darren Monahan. Mon- uh, Monahan. Yep. Uh, so, what were these early days? I mean, I'm curious about these early days. Sure. You understand that you were one of the first ideas was a, a might and magic game. <laughs> well, well, actually, that was one. Well, actually, one of the, the first idea was so there was a game that we that we worked on that that we published for Snowblind Studios. Um, that was called that actually Chris Avalon did a lot of design for though uh, called Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. So it was a oh yeah yeah forgot the Alpha like game on PS2 and then it was ported to Xbox and GameCube. But um, so we had the rights to the engine and internally Black Owl did Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2. So we because we were pretty good friends with with the guys up at Snowblind um, and Ryan Geifman and uh, Brian Sostrom, yes and Ezra Drybach. Um, and we, so we're like, okay, we could take that and we will make a Star Wars version. You know, basically do a Star Wars action RPG. You know, you have a little droid. I, it's not be cool. I still think it'd be a cool game, right? And so we, so we, we uh, so I knew the guy who was running Lucas at the time, uh, Simon Jeffrey. And I called him up and said, hey, like, what about this? He said, oh, it's kind of a cool idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, well, let's keep on talking about that. So we, we're, we kept on talking about it. And then, then I forgot how long after that, he called me up and said, hey, what about KOTOR 2? And I said, okay, you know, um, and I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, BioWare's not interested in doing it. And so I said, okay. And we need to negotiate a contract. And so, you know, for about, you know, from, I would say, I forgot these dates, but let's say, you know, Four months or so from when I left Interplay to, you know, we have a signed contract and we're working on a game. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part four, the fourth and final installment of this interview with uh, Mr. Urquhart. There's a lot of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you very, very, very much, guys. If you have supported the show, really means a lot to me. And if you are one of those folks who's, that are still watching but not uh, supporting, you know, why not? It only takes a few minutes, really easy. And whatever level you feel the show is worth to you and that you're comfortable with is fine. So uh, please just follow the links in the show notes. Uh, you'll be glad you did. All right, so I've got a couple of uh, uh, news items. Uh, one is this game that I've been talking about, Stash, uh, No Loot Left Behind. Uh, we had the uh, the designer of that, Michael Hartman, on uh, the uh, monthly Google Air Hangout. Got to chat with him. He's a really stand-up guy, and he really uh, gets what we like about good old turn-based games like Pool of Radiance and whatnot. Uh, this game, it looks really cool. If you haven't seen this, go over there right away and look at the Kickstarter video for it. Uh, they've only got five days left, and they're about $12,000 shy of their goal. I'm guessing they're probably going to make it, but, you know, it sure would be nice uh, for you guys uh, to go ahead and, and head over there. It'd be, it'd be a real shame if this game uh, wasn't made, so uh, please consider that. Um, also, something kind of cool I noticed on Opposable Thumbs uh, this morning, they've got a little feature they're calling Same Box uh, Better Graphics. And this is something that's always intrigued me, but, you know, when a console first comes out, there's some launch titles. And the games, I mean, they try their best to make those games look good, but uh, usually by the time the, towards the end of the console's life cycle, the graphics look a lot better. Uh, regardless, you know, there hasn't been any changes in the hardware unnecessarily, but the, just the programmers got better and they're able to uh, deliver better looking uh, graphics. So I thought this uh, feature did a pretty good job of showing some of these. And I'm also curious about, about you guys, what you, uh, you probably have some examples too, maybe on some of the computing platforms where the 
Uh, graphics toward the end were much better than at the beginning, so I'd love to see those. All right, so I also want to announce a little new feature here at Match Hat. Uh, I don't know quite what to call this. I'm just going to call it This Month in Gaming History. I thought we could make the first uh, episode of each month a little special like this. And take a look back 10, 20, 30 years and see what was exciting. Uh, so 10 years ago in September, uh, you probably would have been excited about a game called Fable that was about to roll out. Uh, also, The Sims 2, a little game called Katamari uh, Damacy, which I, don't, I think it took quite a while before that game appeared on, on my radar. Uh, also, the uh, uh, Rome, what was, what was it called, uh, Total War uh, Rome came out, as well as Miss 4 Revelation. So a lot of great stuff coming out uh, 10 years ago in September. Now, 20 years ago, uh, System Shock uh, came out a little, from a company called Looking Glass, a uh, pretty well-known company uh, to uh, guys like us, I guess. But it's kind of fun to think it was 20 years uh, since System Shock came out. I really really startled me. It just doesn't seem like that long ago, but 20 years, guys. And then uh, 30 years ago, uh, one of my favorite games of all time came out, uh, namely Elite. Now, I'm pretty sure this was uh, started off in maybe the BBC Micro or Acorn system, so it probably took a while before, they, before it got ported by a Fiber to the C64, but anyway, definitely fond memories of that game. Uh, so there you have it for the uh, This Month in Gaming History. Now, what about that ale of the week? Well, uh, this week I've got a little number called the Oktoberfest Martin Style. Now, even though it's not October, I guess these beer guys are kind of like uh, the department stores are with Christmas, and they start rolling out all the uh, Christmas stuff sometime in February. Uh, well, this one is uh, from Summit Brewing Company, which is just right up the road from me, I believe. They're uh, based out of uh, St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. So one of these days, I'm going to have to see if they've got a brewery for me to visit. Let's see, I don't see anything else here. Usually they put a little text on the bottle, but I see nothing about it other than Martin style. Oh, oh there we go. Alcohol 7.1% uh, by volume. So that's definitely stronger than a Budweiser. Uh, it's actually, I'm kind of surprised to see that high of uh, alcohol content in the Summit. Uh, usually these guys are pretty conservative with their, with their alcohol, so uh, that should be interesting. Water, bar barley, malt, hops, and yeast. So let's uh, see how good of a job they did with the with the flavors of the, the Martin Style Oktoberfest. All right, so I got some of this Summit Martin Style here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> smells really good. I get kind of a strawberry and cherry-like uh, aroma to this. It smells very sweet, very uh, very refreshing. Uh, just a really nice aroma to it. You know, as uh, I've been every now and then I'll talk to somebody about beer and they'll tell me that they, they just hate the taste of beer and they only drink these really syrupy, sweet uh, mixed drinks and cocktails and things. And you know, one of these days I'm going to have to put together a little newbie guide uh, to beer because, you know, if, if you just try something like Budweiser and Miller Lite and you hate that, you really can't judge beer just based on those. You know, the, you really have to do a little research and find some that you like. Uh, I personally, I started off hating beer too, of course, I guess everybody does, but when I started to get into the stouts and the black ales, I really liked the way that those tasted. Eventually I was able to expand on out and acquire a taste for all sorts of different flavors. Uh, so I guess if you're, uh, you know, if you, if you just hate the taste of beer, I'd recommend go to, go to a nice uh, liquor store with a big selection and try a stout. If you don't like that, try a wheat. You know, if you don't like that, try maybe a India pale ale. Uh, but eventually you're going to find some style that you like and there's a lot of variety uh, that you may not appreciate if <laughs> you're just uh, sticking with the, what's commonly available. Anyway, big uh, big wind up for this. Uh, let's try this uh, Summit uh, Martin style. Hmm, interesting uh, flavor on this. It is uh, a, a little bit of a barley-like taste to it. I kind of uh, imagine you know, a little bit of a soggy cornflakes uh, like flavor. Not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but uh, definitely uh, you can taste that. Not as sweet as I would have thought. Not tasting the cherry or strawberry, those sort of fruity flavors uh, that are in the uh, the smell. Let me try it again. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of uh, hard to pin this down. It's a little bit of a grape nuts, kind of cereal-like taste. There's a little bit of bitterness there. I don't taste the, the alcohol at all, though, uh, so that's nice. Uh, not much of an aftertaste. It's a uh, you know, quite light uh, flavor, I guess I should say. I'll try it one more time. Yeah, just uh, definitely very lightly flavored beer. 
you know it's uh, I don't really know too much about the Martin style uh, but if this is a representative of it there's not a whole lot of flavor it's a very light well, almost uh, almost watery <laughs> you can imagine uh, making uh, some Kellogg's Corn Flakes uh, with water and then uh, draining the water off after a couple days and chilling it you know that's kind of what it tastes like to me uh, I'm not I don't really uh, like this one too much I'm gonna go one out of five drinking horns on it uh, then again, I don't know much about the Martin style, so maybe you guys can try this one. Let me know how it compares to, <laughs> to others in that style. But uh, for me, it's a one out of five. Uh, come on, there's much, much better ales out there. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotations about failure in business, you know, after hearing uh, Fergus. And I found one that I thought was pretty funny. Unfortunately, I was not able to find who came up with the quote. Uh, so if you guys can find that and let me know, I'd really appreciate it. But as far as I know, it's anonymous. And I found a couple different variations too, uh, so who knows. But anyway, <laughs> uh, with all that said, here's the quote. Failure is not an option. It comes bundled with your Microsoft product. <laughs> See you guys next week. The Grim Reaper, dude. Oh. How's it hanging, Death? <laughs>